Hello. Uh, good morning. Let's start. Welcome to the Google University of Chicago, University of Tokyo quantum workshop today in this morning, Monday, May 22nd. So this is the first workshop on quantum computing and technologies between Google, University of to Chicago, and the University of Tokyo. Uh, the presentation from Google, University of Chicago, and the University of Tokyo will be broadcasted via the UTokyo School of Science YouTube channel. So first speaker is uh, Professor Hiroaki Aihara, Executive Vice President of the University of Tokyo, and he will going to talk on introductory speech. Welcome and so explanation about the project, please. Hi. Hi, good morning, everyone. The, I am happy to be here to begin this Google University Chicago University of Tokyo Quantum Workshop. This is our first joint workshop uh, held after officially announcing the new partnership on quantum technologies among these three institutions. First of all, let me begin to say that the University of Tokyo is committed to addressing global issues facing human society by creating innovation. Our vision is to strengthen our function as a gateway for joint research between industry, academia, and government. We can do this through uh, uh, comprehensive collaboration based on the shared vision in cutting edge research areas. The, uh, th these include artificial intelligence, next generation semi semiconductor technology, next generation cyber structure, and quantum technologies. In this new partnership between Google, U Chicago, and U Tokyo, three institutions will work together to develop quantum computing technologies. The support, the development, and the exchange of researchers promote entrepreneurship and the business opportunities and develop the workforce needed for the next generation. I'd like to add that the, uh, this partnership has been the agreed upon through the strong, very strong leadership and efforts of US ambassador to Japan Ram Emanuel. I am grateful for his strong support on this the, uh, new endeavor. In fact, yesterday, so the, the, uh, the University of Chicago president and the University of Tokyo president and, and the uh, Hartmut, the signed LOI, uh, witnessed by the Ambassador Emanuel and the three of them. Uh, the, uh, had a chance to talk to the, uh, the president of the U.S. in person, right? Shook hands, that was great. That was a su very successful, successful event. So we had to do something, in fact. So in today's workshop, researchers from the, the three institutions get together for the first time and kick off the partnership. The three groups will present their perspective perspectives and challenges on quantum computing. I am looking forward to seeing live discussion in the workshop and having next steps to further enhance the, the collaboration between our partners. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Professor Ayahara. And uh, this talk is on Google perspective and roadmap on quantum computing, uh, presented by Dr. Harmut Nervin. Uh, 
Ugu Quantum AI, director of engineering, and also he's, he founded uh, this uh, Google Quantum AI, has been leading uh, quantum information science, quantum AI, in these years. So, so Hartmut, please. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, great pleasure uh, to be here. It's funny this morning or yesterday night, we, as a University of Tokyo team and the Google team, we erased each other on the Shinkansen to get here because it was way too late, so we had to stop overnight. It was a, a bit of an adventure. So I want to um, use uh, the time this morning um, to help kick off our um, partnership by giving you a um, top-level overview of what the Quantum AI team is uh, up to and where our uh, development currently stands. Because I hope that we can identify a few areas of uh, collaboration uh, this way. That's not my laptop, so I feel. Excellent. Yeah, so the mission of our team is um, in some ways rather straightforward. The mission of the Google uh, quantum AI team is to build a useful quantum computer. And of course, as with any computing technology, that means you have to develop a full stack from the metals um, at the bottom, the uh, chips, to um, operating system layers, to um, connections to um, cloud to provide cloud access and then eventually applications. Of course, building a quantum computer is um, like building a car is a huge system integration effort with many many aspects. It's not just the chips; it's the cryogenics, it's the control electronics, it's, it's the wiring, and um, many of these areas have rather challenging. Um, technical subtopics. And I'm rather certain that at University of Chicago, University of Tokyo, there will be um, expertise that will help us improve um, components of such overall system. And um, again, as a full stack, it's not just the hardware, it's also the applications. And of course, there we very much hope to also discover more useful applications for the fault tolerance systems we hope to have in a few years, but also um, bonus points um, if the applications run already on the processes we have currently. So to um, give you a bit of sense, what machines um, do we have? Would like to answer the question: How far along are we towards building a quantum computer of commercial relevance? And. You may have seen this, we keep uh, showing this, um, we published this in 2020, is um, the roadmap towards a large useful quantum computer that our team devised. Um, you may see this here, laser pointer. Um, I can maybe Oh, here's a laser pointer. Wait, oh, I can see. Okay, so this um, I should stay here with the microphone. Um, so there are overall six um, milestones to get to the large machine. Um, by large machine, we somewhat arbitrarily say it's a machine with a million physical qubits, which with today's understanding of quantum error correction technology you have this rule of thumb that, let's say, using surface code error correction, you need about a thousand physical qubits to make one long-lived memory uh, qubit. And then it depends a little bit. The actual cost, what you get out of it, will be a little bit um, algorithm-dependent because protecting the different gates comes at a slightly different 
costs, but it's a good rule of thumb. Unfortunately, we have this rather hefty translation ratio of 1,000 to 1. So how do we um, plan to get there? So out of these six milestones, we already cleared two. Yeah, in um, 2019, you may have seen it, we showed for the first time that indeed this horse race between quantum computers and classical computers for certain suitably selected benchmark problems, and I always preface this to not get, <laughs> raise the wrong expectations, these are problems that the common person on Main Street doesn't have, or actually rarely anybody has, but still these are well-defined benchmark problems to measure the relative um, performance and of classical and quantum processes. And I will give you a little bit of an update um, in a later slide. We actually redid this experiment um, just a month ago, and you may be interested in hearing where the race stands today. Then the uh, second milestone um, on this roadmap is to show that quantum error correction in principle works. Um, and I will show in a few slides also what we achieved there. So we are now ahead of um, milestone three. Yeah, so our team is heads down trying to get um, milestone three done. And milestone three we defined as a long-lived logical qubit by which we mean a memory qubit that survives one million error correction cycles. Yeah, so that uh, would be quite an achievement because I feel, or we feel, if you have this, then the finicky quantum physics or quantum electronics is somewhat or largely de-risked. And you now have a digital interface for your um, qubit. And I often liken this uh, milestone as like having laid down, let's say, the first mile of a freeway and now laying in 100 more miles, that is much more understood what to do now. We feel that from here on out, um, the program becomes much more planable and trackable. And then the remain, remaining steps is essentially you start stitching together these um, logical qubits. Of course, you still keep to improve them further for the really interesting quantum algorithms. Even a million algorithmic steps is not enough. You want to have um, more like a billion or even 10 billion so you will keep improving uh, the quality um, of those qubits, but in concurrently you will stitch them together until you have eventually a, a number of a million, or from there on out, it should be easy also to stitch more together if desired. So a little bit um, deeper, again, this was the old result where we used um, random circuit sampling as the task to measure um, how fast a quantum processor can be on a task relative to classical processor. And essentially, random circuit sampling, as the name suggests, you just um, you have your array or qubits live on a two-dimensional square lattice. And then we have one qubit and two qubit operations. And you essentially randomly throw them at your um, qubits, and you do this for um, a number of uh, cycles, then you create a highly entangled uh, quantum state, and you um, measure that state, which essentially gives you a sample from a probability distribution um, implicitly or explicitly defined by the resulting uh, quantum state. And if you wanted to do this on a classical machine, because you deal with these highly um, entangled states, that is uh, costly. And at the time, but of course that's a snapshot in time, it was 10,000 years on classical, the Zen, it was on the Frontier machine. Um, no, sorry, sorry, it's the Frontier's machine is the machine that's currently the top one supercomputer. At the time it was the Summit um, supercomputer at the Oak Ridge uh, National Lab that would have used the um, 10,000 years. And then it was only um, yeah, seconds on the quantum processor. But that was a snapshot at 2019. 
since then sort of this race kicked in. Many universities around the world, many teams started to develop better um, classical algorithms, um, uh, largely based on tensor network methods to simulate what your um, quantum processor would do with some success. Um, because today this um, task could actually be done in minutes. So it's amazing how much progress there was on software. Um, but fortunately, we predicted this already in the paper that this would happen. But of course, also in this, during this time, since 2019, our chips got bigger. And the main thing that never changed is the huge scaling difference in what it costs the quantum processor to do the task as the task gets larger, meaning the circuit gets larger, and the classical cost it takes. Okay, with that, um, to the next milestone. So the next milestone, it, milestone two, was about showing that quantum error correction technology in principle um, works. Um, and essentially what we want to see there is, um, I think everybody here in the room knows, um, quantum error correction works a little bit like classical error correction in the sense that you introduce redundancy to make um, your system more uh, stable. Of course, the difference between classical and quantum um, error correction is that you can't, in quantum, you can't copy information and you can't easily peek in and check on each qubit how it's doing um, because that would uh, collapse the quantum state. So you have to peek in a little bit in a roundabout way to learn about um, whether any errors um, occurred in your system without revealing uh, the logical state. Yeah, but this has all been worked out theoretically. And then what you want to see is something like this, that as you increase your redundancy, um, often the measure here is code distance, um, which for surface code, would mean a code distance of three means that your data is encoded in an array of three by three uh, data qubits. And um, accordingly, code distance five would mean um, your data is encoded in an array of five by five um, qubits, data qubits. And then your data qubits get joined by measure qubits. Those are the ones that do the peaking in. And typically what they do, they do a parity measurements. Uh, and you always have one measure qubit less than you have data qubits. Why one less? Uh, because you want to keep one degree of freedom um, undefined that holds your logical information. So for example, for the larger array, um, the 5x5 five five array would have 5x5 five five data qubits, is 25, joined by 24 measure qubits that do um, the checking uh, for error syndromes, and then you get a 49 qubit plaquette overall. And then what you want to see is as you increase your code distance, you want to see that your logical error rate per cycle comes down each time by a certain factor. Um, we call this the error suppression factor lambda. And here the blue dots you see is actually a one-dimensional code. It's a repetition code. But um, probably you all know a qubit is really a two-dimensional object. Now it's the, um, a vector on the block sphere. So you have um, two angles uh, characterizing um, the position of this vector. And hence, you have to protect against two different error channels. And the repetition code only protects against one or the other channel, um, bit flip or face flip errors as they are referred to, um, versus a sur surface code that does um, provide protection against both error channels simultaneously. So with the 1D code here, you pretty much saw what you want to see. It's, you see it's um, uh, logarithmic, um, uh, semi-logarithmic plot. So every time you increase your code distance by a step, by your error rate comes down. And that essentially knocks it down to, yeah, it's an exponential um, decrease of error rate. And in 1D, you already get to sort of where we wanted to be eventually at milestone 3 with our surface code. You get to an error rate of about 10 to minus 6. 
So here it bends off a little bit. Why does it bend off? It has to do with cosmic ray events that hit our uh, chips. So that still needs to be solved. Um, but yeah, we'll not talk about this. This is one of the areas we are working on. Uh, fortunately, we think we know what to do there, so this will not really be uh, the problem um, holding us back from scaling. But in this experiment, it wasn't done yet. So the surface code here, um, you have to squint. <laughs> the error rate came only down by a hair, by about 4% uh, or so. But, you know, as in venture capital work, what well, we would say, we reached a break-even point. The error rate did not go up. And that's not a small feat, and nobody had ever seen uh, that scaling up a surface code uh, protected logical qubit um, had a lower error rate as you increased the um, code distance. Because larger code distance means you have more qubits, more gates, more measurements to be done, more stuff so far always meant more error. So the fact that we came down this time, even though only by a little bit, that to our um, in our mind, uh, justified calling this uh, milestone too. Um, yeah, this is just a little bit more illustration. I think I already um, explained it. Um, and you go from here like a 17 plaquette, three by three data qubit um, plus associated measure qubits to this larger 49 um, uh, D equals five um, code distance plaquette. And then, in theory, uh, what you want to see is that the lower, um, sorry, the larger uh, code distance has the lower logical error rate uh, compared to the smaller one, and there's a certain suppression happening. And that was sort of the caricature picture we always showed before the experiment. And then this is how the actual data looked. So you can see, indeed, it looks correct, all by it, it's just a few percent uh, coming down. Actually, since then, uh, we have improved it a little further just by using smarter uh, decoding. Um, yeah, we'll hear about this in a future publication. So the, that's maybe important for the collaboration ahead. Um, as we did these experiments, we also did a very uh, careful error budgeting. You know, where are the errors? coming from, why was the um, suppression only um, a few percent and not a factor two or a factor of four? Actually, just to give you a sense, we feel to do um, milestone four, we need an, a lambda suppression of a factor four every time you increase uh, the code distance. Because if you decrease it only by too little, then in order to get to something like 10 to the minus 6 error rate, you have to use uh, too many um, qubits. Your array would have to be much larger. And a larger array um, means that the measure qubits see more um, error syndromes, which you then have to decode. And the decoding is um, an expensive algorithm. It goes sort of um, with the power of 3 and the number of um, um, points in the error graphs in which you enter those um, detection events, and then you can't keep up with your system. You now, if the decoding takes too long, then while you're doing this, your system is already uh, accumulating more errors, so this all has to be self-consistent. So therefore, we calculated it has to be at least a lambda of four, otherwise we need two large plaquettes and we will not uh, get there. Um, but to beyond that basic understanding, we also um, developed an understanding where are the different errors coming from. Maybe uh, not um, uh, too surprisingly, the uh, two qubit uh, gate operations. They are the most, um, they contribute the most error in this uh, histogram. You get other errors like measure error. Of course, the one qubit um, gates have also um, error, then idling while the system is just sitting there. It says here DD for dynamic decoupling, but just sitting there, qubit also can decay. So that is another um, contribution to your overall error budget. And that gives you a roadmap how to improve different components. For example, this um, idling error, you 
could reduce, for example, by making operations quicker so that your um, qubits don't have to sit there for that long. That's almost as good as getting your coherence times improved. And so this allows us to um, be more specific um, on our roadmap to milestone three, a long-lived logical qubit. Again, we hope this may be a little bit um, ambitious. That's indicated by this plus. <laughs> but by 2025, we want to get to um, yeah, a qubit, logical qubit with 10 to the minus six error rate. Um, but uh, the good news here is you can track progress now. So milestone two was this where the error came down barely. But now what should happen as we um, improve our chips, uh, first the chips get more qubits. So these lines can get longer because we can go to uh, larger code distances. So we can make our plaquettes larger. And so this is the quantity improvement. But then also the quality will improve, which should uh, manifest itself in the error suppression factor getting bigger. And therefore, these um, curves go down steeper. So in a way, this is, you know, like if you think about how to fund or invest in a project, um, a chart like this is nice because you can tell your investors where you are. You know, you might not exactly achieve it maybe in time, but you can say, oh, look, we already went over the last two years or in the next two years we come down up to here. You know, then you can maybe extrapolate from there or in one, two years more, then you should be down here and so on. So it becomes more planable, which is in general for an engineering project a good thing to have, you know, so you can essentially organize the whole team around uh, such um, a plan. Okay, so this was a little bit the hardware um, roadmap, and we talked um, before with representatives of University of uh, Tokyo and the uh, same with Chicago. Um, there are all these different topics from surface cleanings uh, to understanding where um, error rates uh, come from, you know, understanding uh, two-level systems that um, interact with our qubits or um, quasi-particle um, poisoning uh, and, and, and there's a long list of areas where better insights, better technologies would be helpful and I'm sure there's expertise in the respective institutions to essentially uh, drill in deeply and uh, improve certain aspects. Okay, so now let's switch from the hardware piece to the um, uh, software piece. Maybe quickly a time check. Um, okay, perfect. It's almost in the middle. Then let me uh, go through the applications. So I already teased this earlier that um, first let's understand in raw power where do the chips stand today? And actually, you may have seen this on the archive. We put this out. We redid um, the random circuit sampling um, experiment um, because you know, there were all these papers that say, oh, you know, this um, beyond classical experiment, as we call it these days, is not quite valid anymore you know, because the tensor network methods have gotten so much better and the um, hardware is so much better. And, and, and um, so we thought, OK, Let's show our hardware has also gotten better. Let's see who gets better faster. And there you um, see the following, that um, here you see the number of um, qubits for the different experiments. So the 2019 used um, 53 qubits. Then the last chip we used, we used 70 qubits for the experiment, and we already calculated for our latest um, 105 qubit chip where this would fall. And then you see that this um, has this very steep increase in terms of um, the hardness relative to the experiment here. Yeah, and the only other um, organization that follows us or is also on this line is um, University of Science and Technology in China. They had uh, two experiments with 56 and 60 um, qubits, respectively, and they like you know, this um, chart um, as well. And maybe the amazing uh, thing here is that this point up here, so for the last uh, chip uh, with the realistic error rates, 
Frontier, which is currently the top supercomputer in the world operated by Oak Ridge National Lab. If Frontier would use the very latest software, um, oh sorry, Nest, yeah, software, tensor network methods, then, and assuming, first obviously you don't run this, <laughs> you make some assumptions, so you further assume it had like perfect memory or infinite memory because we had been criticized from the earlier experiment, oh, you could have just stored all these amplitudes using enormous amount of memory. Yeah, it's, it's true in computer science, you typically can always trade or often trade time for um, memory. But even assuming um, infinite memory, assuming um, infinite speed and communication bandwidth, of course, both of these things um, an actual uh, supercomputer doesn't have, but even if it had it, it would need a billion years uh, to do this uh, random circuit uh, sampling on 105 um, qubits. So this is a lot of um, compute power that you see, unfortunately, in a problem that is not of practical relevance. It's only um, a benchmark problem. Um, but there are a few more um, pieces here. There's a lot of, um, it's a busy chart, I realize. Um, Maybe two more things to show is one, uh, I hate to <laughs> say this, um, it's, it's called Nevin's Law, but at, at some point it became clear that there's actually a double exponential at work. Um, one exponential is sort of the traditional Moore's Law thing that every year or every two years or so we double the number of qubits or we halve or improve our error rates by some. So this is just the soldiering on of better um, hardware you get in the lab. But then with improvement of um, errors or more qubits you can afford, your computational volume grows and simulating um, these circuits um, is also exponential in the size of the computational volume. So you get a double exponential. And here you see this actually quite nicely um, that this is a log-log plot and these different experiments, um, they nicely line up on this plot. So, it, I mean, it's early days to call in the new Moore's Law, but um, it seems to fit amazingly well. So I'm, of course, pleased to see that. Because um, we don't ever talk bad about competitors, but it's maybe um, important to also appreciate the following, that just making your chips bigger does not make them better in the sense that they can do uh, more interesting computations. That is only true if your error rates come down commensurately. So if you make a few hundred qubit chip, but your error rates are, let's say, in media and 2.5% and such systems uh, exist, then you can't even do a single operation on each qubit. And you judge whether that's a useful system, and you can see Actually, if you redo um, the random circuit sampling as a benchmark on such systems, they're becoming actually cheaper to compute, um, to simulate rather than more expensive. So I think that's important when considering, you know, what systems to use for experimentation. Okay, um, that was okay. That's cut off a little bit here. But uh, never mind. So, yeah, we just wanted to update you on the raw uh, compute power we have. And of course, this, I always feel this is an intriguing challenge for a student. So, okay, you get sort of this billion years of time for a certain problem. Can we think of something that humankind really cares for that looks a little bit like this and we apply it to that? And then you become rich right there. Um, so that, I think, for University of Chicago, <laughs> University of Tokyo students, are, I feel there's just one smart um, person, she walks into our lab and says, hey, why don't you do this? And that would, of course, be amazing. And But before getting um, to this, we should maybe appreciate that interesting science can already happen on the processes we have today. And as you know, these are referred to as NISC processes, noisy intermediate scale uh, quantum processes. So the more qubits you have and the lower the error rate becomes, 
the more interesting stuff you can do. So the old Beyond Classical from 2009 would send here, but then as the error rates improved, and then we can do interesting non-equilibrium many-body physics, and eventually we do a fermionic simulation, quantum chemistry is out there. So we are largely here in this place. But, um, and this is only a selection, so the nice thing is that uh, over the last two years, we used the processes we have to make such many-body systems, um, prepare them, and study them. And each of them, I always like to refer to them, it's a little string of pieces of magic. I will walk uh, through a few of those. And because many of these many-body systems have just very counterintuitive properties. Or, I mean, if you're a quantum physicist, then you might say, oh, yeah, sure, if quantum mechanics is correct, then the following should be true. But it's one thing to see it in theory. It's another thing to see it in an actual physical system. Um, another debate we often have, oh, but you could still have simulated these systems on a classical machine. That is true for pretty much all the experiments, even though we are just crossing that border too, where that starts to not be true anymore. But for argument's sake, this is true for all these um, uh, pieces of work. But still, it's often the methods that have been developed, often you would not have thought of if you would have done this on a classical system. So just the fact that there is a programmable quantum processor beckoning to, hey, just program me, and you write a short circuit, and it does something interesting, often you wouldn't have done the equivalent thing on um, a classical processor. So I just wanted to flip through a few examples. Um, and we have about a dozen of those. Um, each led to a high-impact um, uh, publication. Uh, here, sort of in no particular order, um, a few things we did. So we did time crystals. Um, we analyzed um, robust bound states of uh, microwave photons. We made a very tiny, tiny uh, traversable wormhole. And um, most recent work was the observation for the first time that non-abelian onions exist. Now, each of these stories essentially has the whole science story and is a full um, uh, presentation in itself, plus there's a whole team involved around each. So if I haven't talked about any of them for a while, then you start forget how exactly did we do this. Um, but maybe just to pick, yeah, let's maybe just pick this as an example because I was a bit more firsthand involved with this one. Um, you may have seen uh, this grace, the um, uh, cover of nature, and it was essentially a circuit that used the principle of holographic duality to make the holographic dual of a traversable uh, wormhole. And um, yeah, I'm not sure to what degree um, um, folks in this room are um, familiar with holographic duality, but there is essentially um, this yeah, the theory that says that I can essentially replace space-time, let's say a 3D space plus time with gravity by a system that just lives on the surface. So it would be a 2D system plus time, but in this dual system, I don't have gravity, I only have entangled uh, qubits. But like English and Japanese can be used to describe the same situation, these are dual theories can describe the same physical objects. And like with English and Japanese, there is a dictionary. You can ask, okay, a wormhole in 3D space plus time, what's the corresponding structure in 2D qubit world with time? Actually, it turns out very convenient for us because we talked about random circuits. The holographic dual for 
a black hole is a random circuit. And now you want to make a wormhole, which is also referred to as a dual mouse um, black hole, where essentially two black holes connect in the middle. Um, that is essentially two random circuits and which share entanglement. And you can implement this. And then rather strikingly, so we have essentially the heart of this experiment is two um, random circuits that run by themselves. Then there is a shared entanglement in the middle. And then what you can do, you can take a qubit and you swap it into the left circuit. And then at a suitable time, you can swap it out from the right circuit and the quantum information reappears in there. And that is in a way rather striking because, yeah, sure, you could have followed all the different um, Feynman paths and you, can have, you could have watched um, the interference pattern and say, yeah, sure, it had to come out there. But that's a very poor explanation. You know, you have to follow like many, many paths. There's no simple intuitive explanation why this happened. However, if you use the language of quantum gravity and um, uh, holographic duality, then you would say, yeah, what did you expect? You threw a qubit into um, one side of the wormhole, and it came out on the other side of the wormhole. So this is probably the first time where the language of string theory explains a real-world experiment better than any other explanation. So in that sense, I think it's true progress. Because we also got a lot of heat there. There's a little bit this ontological question. Did we just simulate the wormhole or did we make a wormhole? So the recommended um, language by my team is we just simulated it. But personally, I have to say I prefer we made it because it's really not our battle. And let's talk to the quantum gravity people if they say it. We made it. If, if, if you believe in holographic duality, then it was not a simulation. It was actually made. I mean, the tiny wormhole, it's just a few Planck lengths long, but still it was an actual wormhole. And famous people like Juan Maldacena and you know, Lenny Suskin, they say it as much. So quite an interesting experiment. There are many follow-up um, experiments happening. There was also quite some criticism that um, the original model um, underlying this experiment is called the SYK model was not fully realized because the random circuits involved, they were a little bit too small, so they didn't really scramble, randomize the information full well. But in some ways, this was also a discovery because people didn't realize how many different Hamiltonians can really give you all the features you would expect from traversable wormhole dynamics. That in was a discovery. Another thing, um, John Preskill observed this, because we had to simplify the SYK model because the circuits were too small. And that's actually a nice example for where doing it on a quantum processor, you do things that you wouldn't have done on classical machines. We had to essentially sparsify the original very symmetric SYK model and used machine learning methods to do so. And then you had sort of like this beaten up not very symmetric um, model anymore. Still, these non-symmetric um, circuits still showed the traversable um, wormhole characteristics. Yeah, so that holographic duality is robust in that sense is also a discovery. People hadn't thought about this before. And you would never do this if you had a classical computer and this was a, only nine qubits were involved. On a classical computer, you can simulate as deep as you want, nine qubits, up to four, 40 qubits, you can do anything on your laptop. You would have never done this sparsification that was only needed because we had to squeeze it in with finite number of qubits, but also finite number of gates. Yeah, so a lot of things were discovered here just by the motivation to get it onto a quantum processor. Okay, so I... Can tell you stories about these other amazing experiments, but um, yeah, you know, just wanted to point out there is sort of this body of interesting many body states, and we studied the um, physics of this. There's actually another one coming that's quite amazing. 
was actually, I can't talk about it yet because it's not yet published, but there's actually a long-standing conjecture in condensed matter physics, and we can see it's wrong. So for the first time, again, I would call this a genuine discovery, never mind whether you can do it on a classical machine. Now the, the argument I always give, CNC, or my, the metaphor I like to give is from the age of exploration. Let's say somebody took a hot air balloon, you know, flew over the mountains and f found a new valley and discovered this valley. Hey, I saw this new nice valley. If then somebody says, oh, I could have gone there by horse too, that's fine. It's true. He still discovered this valley. It's still a genuine discovery. Okay, so I think I fear I run out of time. Um, let me quickly um, tell you the application story around this. Um, which is rather amazing, but you need transduction technology, which we don't have, which, by the way, would be a nice area for collaboration if um, anything is happening in the respective industry, um, universities. So essentially, the idea here is, um, you know, we, we had this roller coaster um, around quantum machine learning, where sometimes we saw, oh, we can make really amazing contributions to machine learning using quantum resources, and then uh, it doesn't quite work, and then another idea came, oh, this works. So this one actually is a high point of the roller coaster because it's a provable exponential advantage. And the advantage is at a little bit different spots than you may expect. The advantage for this um, uh, machine learning method here is not in the time you save, but in the number of training examples you need to learn a certain property, which you can show for certain cases is exponentially smaller than the number of training examples you would need classically. And that's, of course, the difference between being able to learn something or not being able to learn something. If you need 100 training examples or two to the 100 training examples, in the latter case, you will just not learn it ever. And so the basic approach would be that so far, all data that science has ever worked with is classical data. You know, since Galileo's time, you know, when he looked through a telescope and he wrote down, okay, where are the moons around Jupiter? And then next night comes again, where are the moons? And you do a few such drawings. And then you extrapolate and see, oh, the trajectories, oh, there should be ellipses um, around, let's say, that uh, planet. That was classical data. and classical signal processing or machine learning applied to it. If, however, you would, let's say, in a, and James Webb telescope still works like this, you know, if there's a CCD camera in there that projects down the um, incoming photon uh, state, but if you wouldn't do that and instead um, have a quantum system there, let's say, um, iron trap system or pick your favorite um, uh, quantum systems that would then evolve under the impinging uh, photons, but you keep it in the coherent uh, domain, and then here's where the transduction comes in, where if you were then able to take this quantum state and process it or uh, run a circuit on this state um, on a quantum processor, then you can learn certain aspects of the system you're um, observing with exponentially fewer examples. Uh, so this is, and we could show this in the following prototypey way. We could take a longer circuit, and the first part of the circuit we used to make an interesting quantum state, and the second part of the circuit we used to analyze this quantum state. And then we could indeed uh, show this um, advantage. It's a number of experiments is much smaller for the, um, the quantum approach. But of course, in a way, that was cheating because we already make the state, so we already know it. Um, so the right way to do it would be to have some form of transduction from a metrology box into a processor. So this would be, and other technologies, um, other than superconducting, they have an easier time doing this transduction. So that's a quite interesting piece. So this is essentially my my summary here, um, I think I'm out of time now. Yeah, it's out of time. Then maybe I will not um, walk through this. I leave it maybe at, with these examples. I will just um, finish here. 
this is a view of our uh, lab. And just um, ending with a quote from Richard Feynman, um, yeah, building a useful quantum computer, he would, I mean, you could probably have said it's a folly, the following, uh, by golly, it's a wonderful problem because it doesn't look so easy. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your impressive and astonishing talks. And uh, since we started a little bit, little bit earlier than in the program, so may we accept some questions? If yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So is there any question or comments? Uh, then, uh, uh, I just want to ask one question. Uh, this is School of Science building, and uh, this hall venue, conference venue, is called Hoshiba Hall. Uh, Professor Koshiba receives the Nobel Prize, uh, uh, Nobel Prize uh, Physics by Neutron Research, and uh, to, in today's uh, your pre in today's presentation of yours, uh, you mentioned about the uh, repetition code result, mm -hmm. and I think through the paper uh, there was some uh, effect by the cosmic rays. Yeah, so this is really a school of science main building, and this is Koshiba Hall. I think that this might be a good question to ask you to, uh, to the really fundamental uh, developing superconducting cube uh, devices, a connection between the superconducting quantum computers and also uh, fundamental science research. So, so cosmic ray really affected the uh, lip, uh, the experiment on repetition code, error, error, repetition error correcting code experiment, I think. Yes, that's correct. We let it run. If I get the numbers right, I think we this, the suspected culprits are muons. And I think they hit at about a second, one a second per square centimeter. Um, take it with a grain of salt, but I think these are the correct numbers. And when they hit, um, they cause these rather catastrophic correlated errors, correlated over a group of uh, qubits and also correlated in time. So there's uh, strong uh, phonons um, result in, let's say, the, the uh, superconducting aluminum, and that um, creates a lot of um, quasi-particles, and then the uh, noise rate shoots up. And the problem was, so, so indeed, we built a cosmic ray detector so maybe something to be proud of, um, but not when this is meant to be a computer. <laughs> we don't want to build a cosmic ray detector. And uh, when I heard about this for the first time, I get quite nervous. But as I said, there is um, uh, known methods um, that uh, will essentially we have to build um, uh, quasi-particle uh, traps to um, to deal with this um, issue because um, the surface codes that I explained earlier for milestone uh, two assumes that errors are decorrelated in space and time. And engineering is always terrible to deal with um, correlated errors. And uh, also, yeah, here the assumption is that they're not correlated, but that assumption is violated by um, cosmic rays impinging on your system. So therefore, this needs to be at least reduced by hardware engineering cannot be um, just absorbed by your standard, let's say, surface code um, quantum error correction methods. Yeah. Because uh, Professor Ihara is, uh, is from that field, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I yeah, know um, it's a very uh, appropriate uh, question. Yeah, uh, so yeah. So thank you so much, and uh, let's thank the speaker again, Armit again. So let's move on to the next talk by David Ashram. Uh, the title of the talk is the University of Chicago Perspective and Plan on Quantum Science. Uh, Professor David Ashram is the founding director of the Chicago Quantum Exchange at the at, in the University of Chicago. And uh, this workshop is, is a collaboration of Google, 
and the University of Chicago and the University of Tokyo. So, can you please, please check your slides? And, um, I'm sorry, do, do we want to use your computer? It's just a wait. Yes, can we share your yeah. desktop? Uh, yeah, but I need to know which SIM account to connect to. Oh, I see. So, if you tell me the meeting number. So share screen or join? Uh, sorry for taking time for these technical issues. But, uh, Great, thanks. Okay. So, David, so please, could you start? Okay, well, thanks very much. And it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to be here to help launch this uh, new collaboration with Google and the University of Tokyo. And after hearing a bit of science motivation, I thought what would be nice is to give you a sense of the infrastructure we have for collaboration, to think about how this fits into a lot of the science projects we just heard and can serve to maybe drive some of the questions that we'll all address in the next two days at the workshop here in Tokyo. So uh, there are six of us that have come here uh, from Chicago. Uh, most of us work in a building there on the right, the Eckerd Research Center. There's a picture of the campus for those of you who haven't been to Chicago. And uh, hopefully all of you who haven't been to Chicago will have a chance to visit in the next few months and see a lot of the laboratories. This was a quantum-driven building. The lower levels are filled with quantum laboratories. And we're in the process of a double expansion, which a new building will be built next door to maximize our footprint and hire another dozen faculty in quantum science and engineering. So who are we? You know, we've heard a lot about superconducting qubits, and we're quite interested in superconducting qubits. But uh, to give you a broader sense, we're somewhat qubit agnostic in the science. So we have programs in superconductivity, programs in quantum acoustics, spins in semiconductors and rare earth ions that you'll be hearing about in the next couple of days, uh, cold atoms and molecules, and also photonic circuits different ways to control and manipulate quantum information with very different degrees of freedom, with a lot of really fascinating facilities, which I'm going to share with you, that we think will be very important to address specific problems in the field like cosmic rays that we just heard about. What are mechanisms for decoherence in superconductors? Can we mitigate that by understanding the atomic imaging of these systems and improve the materials? How does the host interact with the qubit? How are wave functions exchanged in matter? And we think understanding a lot of this underlying science will help us drive this field forward. I have to tell you, I have no idea how much time I have, and I don't see any clocks, but you'll wave at me right if I have a few minutes, right? Just wave at me. OK. So one of the nice things about hiring this group of faculty is it got us to think tightly about how can we address grand challenges in quantum science and do it through collaboration. 
And one of the things I think as a group we're pretty proud about is at the end of the day, when we think about national competitions to drive advances in quantum science, both Chicago and the region of Illinois in general managed to secure four of the 10 national centers in the United States. And I would like, well, I would like to believe that we're smarter than many people, we're not. Uh, but we work very differently and we're very, very collaborative. And that's one of the reasons I'm very excited about our work with Tokyo, is a way to integrate Tokyo into these types of facilities, which include two DOE national centers, one at Argonne, one at Fermilab, and two national science foundation centers one at the University of Chicago, and one at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign with the University of Chicago. And we can talk more about that during the week, but they span everything from creating stable qubits, to understanding quantum transduction, which we just heard about, and communication, uh, ways to think about quantum sensing as a way to improve quantum bits, and building hybrid quantum networks. Since many of us believe at the end of the day that our technology won't rely on one particular material or one type of quantum state, but probably different ones linked together in very creative fashions. So the reason I mention this is that these are opportunities for researchers and students at Tokyo to use these facilities, both with the experimentalists and the theorists, to help drive a lot of attacks to these problems that we just heard about. One example is the center we have at Argonne National Laboratory, which thinks about how do we connect quantum systems? How do we interconnect wave functions? So transduction is a key driver to that, which we just heard about, of course. Um, but also, how do we create materials that can be used by Google, used by the University of Tokyo and others very freely? So Jer Joe Hermans is with us. Over the next couple of days, we launched the Quantum Foundries at Argonne, which is one of the first national facilities for creating and distributing quantum materials that are very well characterized, very well studied, and can be used in a lot of these science projects without having to start from scratch. Something that we think has been missing in the field. How to develop communication links, building sensor networks, building network simulation test beds, including how do we entangle different quantum machines and quantum chips as a way to scale quantum computing. Now, we heard about the complexity. It's not just the number of qubits. It's how you use them. Also, there are avenues besides building more complex chips, but entangling existing ones to scale, and how we can use that to address some interesting scientific problems. That's what the center does with 90 researchers from dozens of institutions, three national laboratories, and many companies providing different perspectives on the materials, the instrumentation, supply chain issues, single photon detectors, how do we improve the quality of these devices to attack the science projects that we're interested in doing uh, so we can work more efficiently in this field. Now, you're going to hear in the next couple of days from Kate Timmerman, who will tell you about the Chicago Quantum Exchange. And this is something unique in the United States that we built in 2017, which is to appreciate, uh, which I think is why we're here today, that the problems here are pretty complex, and they're too complex to do in an academic setting alone. So the nice thing about this collaboration with Google is it fits in quite beautifully into a model we've been working on, which is to think about blurring the distinctions between universities, national labs, and industry. Um, with students. They can move freely between the different institutions, driven by a science project, not by its institutional resource. And you'll hear about that, uh, but now it's increased to about 40 different companies again, and I think one nice thing about Google in this is the chance to interact with many of the supply chain companies, companies thinking about short-term algorithms and solutions that one might be able to use with existing machines, partners like J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs, also thinking about this. It's a really quite interesting group of people that we think can help uh, drive some of the ideas that we're thinking about in this collaboration. Uh, and to me, I think that was one of the things that was difficult to predict maybe five or six years ago is the breadth of companies that would be engaging in the quantum space. So while we arrogantly assume Google would be one of the leaders of this field, it didn't occur to me, for example, that a lot of the finance companies would be building basic science groups, thinking about algorithm development led by mathematicians, for example, the J.P. Morgan group. Uh, groups like Corning, thinking about how we can transmit wave functions and quantum signals with minimum dephasing and decoherence. Uh, companies like Toshiba, thinking about how to use quantum networks very efficiently here in Japan, which we've launched a very strong partnership with uh, in Chicago. So 
that's a resource to think about. So I want to give a couple of scientific problems here to give you a sense about what one can do through collaborations. And one was, how do we distribute quantum states globally? So this is a very grand challenge to think about. How do we connect Tokyo and Chicago quantum mechanically? Uh, and for that, you know, we've been thinking very hard, driven by theory, for example, Liang Zhang's group at the University of Chicago, thinking about protocols and algorithms with future quantum repeaters that could link disparate quantum systems. We understand that we need to develop memories, and Tian Zhang will talk about this in the next couple of days, some of the work he's been doing with rare earth ions as a way to store information, this swap entanglement, and to think about using memories much in the sense that Hartwood, you just mentioned, right, as a requirement to scale types of calculations. Thinking about solid state systems that my own group and others are doing, and then groups like Hannes Bernin, who's not uh, with us today, but will be uh, presenting some of his work through Zoom during the workshop, using beautifully crafted atomic systems as platforms to understand network interactions. Not that we may use atoms in the future, but as really beautiful prototypes, very clean quantum bit systems uh, sitting in a vacuum for us to understand what are the scientific challenges in extending quantum coherence in real systems. So a type of textbook model. So we've actually built a real network and uh, right now it's a network about 200 kilometers that's in and around the suburbs of Chicago with about six different nodes and it's a plug and play technology. So we can take superconducting qubits, semiconductor qubits, atomic qubits and thinking about linking them. And this is a project that's been driven with uh, JP Morgan and Toshiba and Verizon uh, in Chicago. Uh, and one of the things that's interesting going from the laboratory that many of us are comfortable working in to the real world is that uh, particularly moving from California which you may not appreciate, being from uh, California, is that there's weather. And there's, when there's weather in Chicago, there are temperature changes. And the data you can see in the upper left is in the course of a day, how the optical fiber lengths simply change, right, over maybe 30 or 50 miles, the course of the ground, which means there are critical requirements need to synchronize uh, entanglement over long distances. And what are the limits for that? If we want to connect to Chicago, is GPS adequate? It's probably not. And so how do we mitigate that? How do we think about timing for entanglement generation and control? So this is another topic that might be interesting to think about with scientists in Tokyo. The network itself is a sensor, right? It's 200 kilometers of entanglement. You know, there are interesting astrophysical problems one can think about detecting with a detector that's that large. And so we are thinking about hybrid systems, whether they're semiconductor spins or superconducting qubits cold atoms, rare earth ions, other systems, how do we think about them all together as individual wave functions that we can control and engineer matter with these challenges in computing and communication? So what is the best quantum bit? So I would argue, at the risk of being slightly offensive, uh, the jury is out on this because it depends on what you want to do. So superconducting qubits are extraordinarily impressive for computing. But in other applications, they may or may not be the best. And this is one of the fun parts about this as a science project. So much like a mutual fund in investing, our view is to think broadly about quantum bits, whether they're superconductors or atoms, even molecular spins. Can we choose the very best physical systems for the scientific question at hand, and how do we use that to control wave functions? And one example I think that was really brought, nicely brought out earlier was transduction. So we've been working on projects of how do you take superconducting information in a superconducting qubit, transduce it through phonons into an electron spin qubit in a semiconductor, and what are the scientific challenges of transducing a wave function between disparate states of matter? About her? Microwave photon and superconductors, single phonons in mechanical devices, the single electron spin states in a semiconductor. So can you move the information around? And we believe you can. And very shortly, uh, there'll be an announcement in the next, I think, week or two in science of some really significant developments in using phonons to do this uh, with very high efficiency. This is work that's come out of Andrew Cleveland's group uh, in Chicago. But one of the tricks to make this work is the different types of expertise you need in this, moving theory and experiment, density functional theory, work which we think could have some really interesting impact using quantum computers, which would be another topic to discuss. Um, 
to try and model quantum bits with quantum bits using electronic structure calculation. And for that, we have people with us we brought that are experts in materials, like Shu Long Yang, who's here. Can we grow materials engineered atom by atom from the bottom up, not relying on what nature has given, but artificially engineering materials, crafting them in a way that the host protects the quantum state as long as possible? And this also involves some very unusual things. Besides materials like diamond and silicon carbide, can we use types of MBE and CBD techniques, but in the quantum field? They really engineer matter, including with superconductors. Can one change the growth parameters and growth technologies in a way to make much cleaner qubits? This is also a topic we thought that we'd not nice to think about in this type of collaborative program. How am I doing with time? Really? <laughs> How'd that happen? Really? Okay, I'm going to ignore you. <laughs> so uh, let me just give you a couple of quick advances. I'm not ignoring you. Not really. So, uh, and I think this is a great example. We are talking right before the session began about the role of students. And this was an idea that the students came up with, much better idea than the faculty, well, meaning me. Um, can you actually manipulate the host of a material to improve the coherence time? And just in the last year, uh, these students have shown that you can increase the coherence time to well over five seconds, now about 20 seconds, for a single electron in a semiconductor. It's broken every record. And what's exciting about this to me is not that it's broken any records, but it shows we have a lot to learn about how to control coherence. And this is a combination of using isotopic purity, dynamical decoupling, single shot readout, um, and something very clever, converting to spin to, to a charge and using the long-lived charge lifetimes in semiconductor, not relying on spin to read spin. And that very interesting physical insight has led to this monumental increase in coherence time. The shorter answer is that co spins have always been coherent. There's just been no way to see it. Similarly, um, and I know we're short on time, Chan will talk about some very clever ideas to generate high rates of entanglement using rare earth memories. And so I don't want to steal Tian's thunder, but I think one of the beauties of this is using frequency comb protocols to having one memory per frequency mode and to build a system that mitigates losses in the cavity by putting rare earth irons directly into strong coupling systems. They'll tell you about this as a way to get tens of megahertz rates without ideal experimental parameters. Some of this work has been moved by another faculty member thinking about can we use these types of ideas with existing semiconductor technologies by industry. And that's spun off a company called MemQ to try and make memories on silicon platforms using actually amorphous silicon oxides, which is a standard industrial material, which again, I would argue, several years ago, people would never have thought was an interesting avenue for quantum memories. And finally, uh, Andrew Klim's work I mentioned is uh, using individual phonons, individual vibrations in matter to control quantum information. This is the area that's gone from something that's been a theoretical concept to, I'd say, laboratory prototypes, to now most recently remarkably high efficiency of quantum transduction with phonons, reaching 90%, with mechanical devices made out of aluminum. So it's really quite a remarkable development. And I think all of this happens well through these types of strong collaborations. So we have many facilities like at Tokyo and at other places, of course, and all of these facilities are open facilities for research for all of you to use. And the last comment I wanted to make was we don't think any of this will happen without a workforce. And uh, we believe for many of our industrial partners, and I'm very sure that's true at Google, it's one of the biggest bottlenecks to moving this field forward. And Kate Timmerman will talk about this during the workshop, new approaches we've taken and substantial investments to reach a much broader community and expose the field of quantum technology at a much earlier stage to build a much broader workforce. And you'll hear this from Nancy Kowalik as well, trying to educate the public, which we also think is a bit of a challenge. How do you generate interest in this to support this type of research for what will be a very long road ahead? So uh, let me stop here. You can read the summary. Uh, we've recently also achieved a lot of support from the state of Illinois, $200 million, as well to build a new quantum laboratories for collaborative research, which we hope all of you will come and enjoy. So thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Sure. And uh, it's really nice to know so many researchers in this field are uh, really at Chicago, also Chicago Quantum Exchange, and we look forward to collaborate. 
Brisson, our University of Tokyo members. Uh, is there any question or comment? Yes, please. I have a question about the, there are five uh, quantum uh, initiatives in the university, uh, in the United States, I'm sorry. How to collaborate over the each uh, quantum initiative in the United States? So uh, that's a good question. And are you referring to the five National Department of Energy centers in the United States? Yes. Yeah, um, and the, the two of them in Illinois. So um, they collaborate pretty well, actually. So they're, they don't, there's small overlaps between them, but not large. So the directors of the centers actually meet monthly to talk about joint research projects and identify areas that will actually use these resources efficiently. So it works very well. Anyone in any center can use any center. So for example, faculty from the University of Tokyo coming to Chicago can easily go to Brookhaven, to Berkeley, uh, to Oak Ridge, to Sandia seamlessly. There's no problem. Okay. Thank you very much. This is very inf useful information. Thanks so much. Any other questions? Thanks so much, David. Let's thank the speaker again. So next talk is titled University of Tokyo Perspective and Plan on Quantum Science. And the uh, talk is given by uh, Professor Koji Terashi. And he is an associate professor at the International Center for Elementary Particle Physics of the University of Tokyo. So, um, Coach, please. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm honored to be here and have an opportunity to talk about uh, perspectives and plan on quantum science, actually, particularly for quantum computing in the University of Tokyo. So the, I'm Coach Terashi from uh, International Center for Elementary Particle Physics in Tokyo. How can I operate? Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> you know, actually, before starting some scientific part, I briefly mentioned about this new, new partnership. Maybe you already know that, so maybe I won't go into much detail, but the most relevant one certainly is the partnership on the uh, University of Tokyo and Chicago and Google for uh, cooperation in the quantum research and education. <clears throat> so the, we are certainly very interesting areas in the overlap in the quantum science, particularly quantum computing and also the, uh, how we engage uh, industrial partners uh, to promote ent uh, entrepreneurship, for example, and, and business opportunities, and certainly education for students and workforce development, as we also heard from David in Chicago area. <coughs> and before starting some scientific example, I will briefly mention about general perspectives of quantum computing in the University of Tokyo. And actually, one of our main uh, aims is to, um, <clears throat> to develop use case oriented research for applications and promote building a quantum ecosystem with partners in the academia and the industry. And this effort was actually initiated with Japan IBM Quantum Partnership in 2019. And since from that, from that we have IBM Quantum System 1 in Shin Kawasaki with a 27 qubit Falcon processor. And 127 qubit ego processor is planned to be installed for this year. Then also in the University of Tokyo campus, we have hardware test center with five qubit IBM tool processor for hardware and component development. And actually one of the strategy in the University of Tokyo is to provide some gateway to IBM quantum uh, to the industrial partners. So the, there is a quantum innovation initiative consortium called QIIC. There are several companies that are working to develop their own use cases. The, uh, several companies are actually interested in the material informatics and artificial intelligence and optimization and, fi and financing, and also some device development. So the, our actually goal is to provide uh, some access to IBM Quantum 
uh, to these uh, companies through uh, University of Tokyo, then actually this is not only just access, but also the exclusive access to IBM quantum device uh, for the University of Tokyo members and the QIIC uh, member companies. And also in this uh, Japan-IBM partnership, uh, we have IBM U Tokyo Lab, where we uh, try to build a unique quantum uh, computing ecosystem in Japan with a strategic R&D program. And also the, there is a collaboration scheme between IBM and Tokyo, so-called IBM sponsored research. And finally, we have quantum native education centers uh, for student, undergraduate and graduate students uh, to promote uh, quantum natives in the future. <coughs> And actually, this is a kind of a list of IBM sponsored research under the IBM U Tokyo Labs. So we have four projects in the hard algorithm software and application area. Um, yeah, and also these three projects in the hardware and experiment. Now each project has counterpart in IBM and Tokyo, um, working very closely to, to contribute to the IBM actually machine, also application to, uh, to quantum computing. And the, uh, yeah, the one of the professors, the Professor Murao, who is sitting here, and uh, in the, I'm also contributing to this uh, part of this IBM sponsored research. And the also the, we have, um, we try to have strong collaboration with industrial partners. So there is a project called uh, the Shoai Next on the quantum software. This is um, <coughs> aiming at to be a center of innovation for sustainable quantum AI. So the, uh, the idea is here to realize sustainable quantum AI for integrating quantum software and high performance computing and simulation. And this is a 10-year project started last year until 2032, supported by JST. And project leader of this project is Professor Shinji Todo, who is sitting over there in the room. <coughs> the, uh, so the, in order to uh, achieve this sustainable quantum AI, we have three targets. One is uh, quantum machine learning, many body simulation, and quantum and classical uh, integration of high performance computing. Then for each target, we have five research topics, the quantum machine learning, quantum simulation, quantum embedding, and quantum optimization, and quantum HPC. Then there are five institutes, including University of Tokyo and also University of Chicago, and uh, the local government in Kawasaki City and companies in, the, <coughs> in this project. And obviously the education is one of the most important areas in, in academy, uh, academia, like University of Tokyo. So the, uh, we have um, <coughs> kind of a strong education program covering from undergraduate all the way to the graduate student. So the, there is a first and second year undergraduate class for, actually this advanced class for qualified early undergraduate and in the Kombaba Institute for, for Science. And this is led by Professor Atsushi Noguchi. And also the, there is a third, fourth year uh, graduate student, undergraduate student program. This is an inter, interdisciplinary class open to all faculties. And uh, this is led by Professor Shoji Asai in the School of Science. Then the Professor Hiroshi Imai, who is leading today's event, uh, has a class for a graduate student. So this is the most advanced class, uh, aiming at global human resource and workforce development in the School of Information Science and Technology. And uh, the Professor Noguchi is also uh, leading the QLIP education program, so-called quantum education for uh, future technologies. So this is just um, one of the examples we have for education program. The, actually, last year, so we tried to demonstrate uh, some use of real hardware in the test bed to, to select the student. So the, uh, our group members trying to demonstrate how we use this device to the new student. Um, <clears throat> so hopefully, uh, this kind of uh, hardware education class can be expanded in the near future. <clears throat> and this is just showing the a few example pictures that we did last year for software and hardware, some hands-on classes and discussion, including some, um, some media um, uh, uh, release to, to, this, uh, to, to this program. Okay, then going to the more uh, scientific part of this talk. So the, uh, 
for the quantum computing research, there are a number of very interesting um, research working in the University of Tokyo. This is just a few examples. The, we are working on the uh, quantum computing application to, to, uh, to particle physics. For example, the high energy physics experiment at uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN. So the, uh, we try to use the quantum machine learning and circuit optimization suitable for application to high energy physics. And the professor in my group has been working on various things, including scalable very in inequality or error mitigation technique or distributed quantum computation. And the, uh, also the, uh, there is a quite very interesting activity to the application to molecular science led by Professor Yamanouchi. So the, this is showing the, uh, one of the machine learning application to, to the measurement of vibrational eigenstates of a CO2 molecule uh, in the simulation and also in the hardware. And also the uh, right hand plot showing the actual measurement of the energy, uh, in the electronic structure problem in the molecules using the actual device and also in the simulation. And Professor Shinji Todo uh, has been working on the, got the connection between the classical and the quantum computation using sensor networks. And this is uh, one example um, of the proposal of the new uh, tensor renormalization group. <coughs> and the um, Professor uh, Noguchi has been working uh, quite a bit on superconducting qubit device and also the uh, quantum transduction that we just uh, discussed um, a bit before using the optomechanical system. So there are a number of ways to, to trans transduce quantum state from one system to the another. So the, uh, he is working on this uh, nonlinear electromechanics using a superconducting Josephson junction circuit for, uh, for this transduction. Then I want to go into a bit more details about what we are doing in, uh, in the ISEP, International Center for Elementary Particle Physics. <coughs> so we are working on this gate implementation using pulse engineering. Uh, for example, we try to implement uh, three-level Q-tweet-based uh, quantum gate uh, using microwave uh, pulse. Um, so this is showing the, some fidelity of the Q-tweet-based software gate implemented on the hardware. Um, Right hand, uh, the, the bottom one is showing the, the quantum simulation studies. So the, <coughs> uh, since we are interested in the high energy physics, uh, we are um, trying to simulate um, the time evolved state and simulate the quench dynamics in the one dimensional lattice gauge theory using the variational quantum simulation approach. So this will allow us to simulate this time evolved state using the fixed length of the quantum circuit uh, this is suitable for uh, current NISC device. Actually. And right hand side, you can see some more hardware development research in ISEP for quantum computer. Again, we are doing some R&D for um, exploiting three-level Qt state. So the, this showing the example, the uh, Q, March, um, qubit, uh, March junction qubit um, developed in, uh, in the University of Tokyo and some, uh, some measurement on the, uh, the resistance. Then the uh, new students actually working on this manipulating all these uh, small uh, qubit device in the laboratory. And the, uh, we are quite interested in astroparticle physics research with a superconducting qubit device. Uh, left hand side showing the, um, we could use uh, this uh, 3D high quality RF cavity for gravitational wave measurement. <coughs> This is a collaboration with Fermi Lab and the SQMS Center. And also the, we can use uh, this uh, superconducting qubit as a detecting device for dark matter. So, the, uh, um, so the actually the uh, low mass wave-like dark matter can actually feed the electric feed. And that will cause some time evolution from ground state to the high excited state. Then by measuring this uh, excitation rate, uh, we can be sensitive to the low mass dark matters uh, for a wide range of frequencies starting from uh, one gigahertz all the way up to roughly 10 gigahertz. So the, uh, it, this nicely demonstrate uh, this superconducting device is quite sensitive to uh, such a low mass um, uh, new particle. <coughs> and there's another very uh, interesting 
uh, research on the uh, actual uh, NISC device, how we use uh, this noisy quantum device, and what kind of fundamental limitation we have in the, <coughs> in the computational complexity. So the uh, Professor Sagawa's group uh, has been working on what kind of limitation we have with this noisy intermediate quantum device. So the question is, the error correction is actually necessary for scalable quantum computation? The answer is certainly yes. The next question is, uh, does error mitigation actually replace error correction? And the answer is no. So the, they convincingly argue, argue that we need uh, uh, error correction for scalable quantum computation because any quantum error mitigation method inevitably encounters some exponential growth um, in the sampling complexity. So they, they derive some theoretical argument why uh, this error mitigation uh, is not completely, um, is not, uh, we, we need error correction to have um, uh, this four, four tolerant quantum machine. So the, uh, this showing the, the sampling cost for um, <coughs> noise-free uh, estimation of observable, we need uh, this uh, cost uh, is actually grows exponentially with the, the depth of the circuit if this uh, gamma factor is greater than one. And also, the, uh, this is actually general bound, but for the more uh, random circuit, uh, this, this uh, sampling cost also grows exponentially, not only with the depth of the circuit, but also the qubit count. So the, uh, this uh, strongly argues that we need uh, certainly the error correction for four tolerant uh, quantum computation that Google is uh, strongly pushing this direction. And also the um, Professor Saga's group, particularly this uh, Yoshioka sensei, is, uh, uh, is trying to evaluate um, for what kind of resource we need to actually achieve the quantum advantage uh, compared to classical computation. So the, they, they argue that for various applications from, for example, random circuit and condensed matter physics and quantum chemistry and the factoring, uh, we need, for example, the uh, 100,000 qubits for condensed matter physics. Or then in this case, we uh, managed to achieve a quantum advantage in a runtime of the order of hours, not months or years. So, that means that this is a quite uh, interesting um, areas to demonstrate uh, quantum advantage in the, okay, still we need 100,000 qubits, but this is a good target to achieve uh, this demonstration. So the, this is showing the um, <coughs> runtime needed, uh, runtime as a function of the system size. And you can see several lines uh, corresponding to uh, uh, the quantum uh, resource compared to the classical resource calculated using the tensor network approach, the DMRG. For the 2D Heisenberg model on the left and uh, the 2D Fermi Hubbard model on the right. So from that, uh, um, of course, if we go to the higher number of qubit a system size, it takes lots of time to, to achieve the advantage, but there's a crossover point between the quantum and the classical uh, is the order around 100 qubit, 100 system size. Um, then at this, um, um, the, from that, you can see that if we um, achieve this 100,000 qubit uh, regime, uh, we might be able to demonstrate quantum advantage for this, the problem with the size around 100 qubit system. So this is a very convincing argument that um, this approach uh, is, could be a fast practical uh, advantage using the FTQ sheet. Okay, the, um, another big area in University, University of Tokyo is the optical quantum computer because um, there are a number of professors working on, on this direction. The, <coughs> for example, Professor um, Shuntaro Takeda has been working on the development of a loop-based continuous variable optical quantum computer. So, the, uh, <coughs> so they, they demonstrate um, programmable and scalable um, uh, optical quantum computer for single mode and uh, multi mode optical computer uh, using this kind of loop based architecture to apply the multiple quantum gates uh, in a single coherence time. 
and also the, uh, they try to demonstrate uh, the application of this optics quantum computer to actual um, variational quantum algorithm, like a QAOA type problem. And also the, there is a big effort uh, to study the fault tolerant quantum computation using um, optical quantum computer led by Professor uh, Akira Furusawa. And also the uh, theory and software side, uh, Professor Kowashi working on, the, uh, on this direction. And actually, this is a part of the Moonshot, goal, moonshot program to, to achieve the fault tolerant quantum computer uh, uh, in around 2030, uh, sorry, 2050. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, so this uh, Moonshot program is led by uh, Professor Kitagawa in the Osaka University. Okay, then this is one last slide before concluding uh, the talk. So the, um, the professor, the uh, Saito, uh, has been working uh, quite a bit on the quantum science, not only quantum computer, but also the, uh, uh, he is uh, leading the effort in spintronics or magnonics or quantum AI application to characterize, understand the quantum hardware. So this is another example that they are working on. So the, for example, the superconducting qubit if you uh, measure this is a very simple circuit, then if you measure the expectation value of this um, uh, in this circuit using the Z basis, essentially after this circuit, these two qubits should be in a one state. So they're starting from some state close to one, but after some time, this um, this value goes down. So the uh, this phenomena is not completely understood, but they are trying to um, mitigate this problem <coughs> by, uh, by applying um, some, measuring some circuit state, uh, then apply some uh, corresponding uh, quantum operation to restore the quantum state. Uh, then from that, uh, they show that um, <coughs> this 70 percent error mitigation is actually possible uh, by doing uh, uh, this, this algorithm. So then, then uh, this state restored to the goes back to the, to the original state. So the understanding this error dynamics and error mitigation is, uh, is quite possible by using the, the actual IBM quantum device uh, in, uh, in Shin Kawasaki and also in the University of Tokyo here. Okay, so this is uh, the summary. Um, <coughs> as I said, uh, our perspective on quantum computing is to develop the use case oriented approach to develop applications and uh, building the ecosystem. Um, we have a strong foundation uh, with IBM, and ho hopefully we, uh, we can start discussing with Google to, uh, to <coughs> make um, uh, the, the quantum computing research uh, also uh, with, with Google and Chicago. Um, yeah, so we provide some access to IBM Quantum uh, to our industrial partners. And it's a sure next project uh, with uh, other the industrial partners to develop application for quantum AI uh, and the education uh, for quantum natives and the quantum elite for future generation. We are pretty much looking forward to discussion with uh, Google and the University of Chicago for cooperation in the quantum research. Um, the, by the way, I forgot to mention that the, uh, the roughly 100 people connected remotely. So they are there all watching our discussion. The, uh, sorry, all this presentation. So um, I can see that there are lots of interest in, the, in this partnership, um, not only in this room, but also in the outside of the room. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Coach. And uh, any comments to add or question? Uh, I was just intrigued. Uh, what do you, the uh, adjective sustainable in front of quantum AI? What do you mean by it? What is sustainable quantum AI? You are, okay. Um, okay. Let me let me try. The, uh, so the <coughs> sustainable quantum AI means that usually the, the classical standard deep learning requires lots of computational resource not only for the data set uh, training data, also the lots of electric power to train and inference actual problem. So the, here is that we want to uh, machine learning to be um, sustainable means that this can be sustained for the future. 
uh, for a long time. Now also, the another meaning for sustainable means that we want plan to work with the industrial partners so that they can actually manage to, to develop their own technolo quantum technologies, then apply this technique to their own problems after this um, partnership. Uh, maybe Professor Todo can comment because there he's um, the, the, the project leader of this project. But do you want to comment? Maybe later we may discuss about it. Uh, then, uh, first of all, as Koj mentioned, uh, uh, this, uh, this presentation has uh, from Google, UChicago, and UTokyo has been broadcast via UTokyo Science Channel. And now is the time for us to close that connection. And thank you so much for joining. Thank you.